to why I tell silly jokes. Anita and the Five Condas. 16th of September 1998. I have previously mentioned the three characteristics of existence, the Tilakla A. And this evening I want to expand on that by focusing on Anita or non-self. I'm doing this so that you can take advantage of the samadhi you've developed so far. During this rains retreat, this will enable you to gain insights into the nature of the mind, the nature of the body, the nature of this universe, and in particular to penetrate into this truth of anatta. Penetrating the truth of anatta is the most fundamental breakthrough. It is that wisdom, that understanding, which when it's attained, will enable you to know that you are a stream winner, a sotapanna. It will also make the Gamma of the Lord Buddha abundantly clear. It will give you understanding of what this practice is all about and also where it leads. You'll understand what Nibbana is and how this whole process works. Focusing on Anatta, non self, is a most important part of Vipassana, or insight. Practice. Throughout the retreat, I've stressed that you cannot split Samitha and Vipassana, and even now I'm not expressing this teaching as anything different from Sumatha. I'm just focusing on another aspect of the practice and using the recollection or investigation of anatta as a means of penetrating truth, as a means of developing deeper and deeper come in the present moment. Every deep insight that you gain should lead to peace and the peace that it brings is a measure of that insight. Sometimes people like to measure insight with convincing arguments and descriptions, or by their brilliant Dhamma talks or books. That is not a measure of insight at all. I've known many people who have written brilliant books without having any deep insight at all. And knowing the nature of their lives you can see that the understanding they have is basically borrowed from someone else. It is not their own. The measure of insight is the ability to make the mind very peaceful and calm. Anyone who experiences deep insight will have no trouble at all in gaining jhanas. Anyone who claims the experience of insight and cannot access those jhanas, for me, anyway, has only superficial insight. Anyone who can gain jhanas should be gaining deep insight. At the very least insight into the nature of this mind, and how the mind plays with the outside world and its senses to its own detriment. When the mind keeps to its own home inside, it experiences far less dukkha and trouble. The String of Pearls This evening I want to focus on that practice which uncovers anatta, the truth of non-self. Many people are not able to fully understand the word anatta. We only fully understand the meaning of these words when the experience arises. All the words that I can use to describe anatta are only pointing in the direction of the meaning. This is sometimes a problem when people mistake the words for the whole meaning and they don't follow those words to see where they are pointing. Anatta is the truth that this sensory experience, by which we can know the world, is without a being, without a person, without a self. As a result of that there is nothing that owns possesses or controls. All that we take to be me is just a misconception. All that we take to be mine results from that misconception. As a result of taking all this to be mine we suffer, we weep and wail when things do not go according to our plans and wishes. To understand deeply the nature of non-self and to train ourselves, the Buddha gave us the Satipahana Sutta, DN 22. The whole purpose of Satipahana is to uncover this illusion of self. Rather than an illusion I'd like to call it a delusion. I'll just pause here a moment to mention the difference between illusion and delusion. To me. Anyway, illusion is pointing out that there is absolutely nothing there and we're making something out of just emptiness. As I understand the Dhamma, Anitta is not illusion it is a delusion. The anatta delusion arises because there is something there. But we misinterpret it to be a self, a being, a me. 
What we misunderstand as being me or mine is actually just a process. The word process is the nearest that we can get to describing the cause and effect. Relationship that occurs on the level of body and mind without there being any core to that cause and effect. One cause arising produces an effect and that effect completely. Vanishing causes another effect sometime in the future, with nothing in between. It's just like a string of pearls that has no string through them. If we look closely between two of those adjacent pearls, there's a space, nothingness. When we can see that space of nothingness we understand there is nothing joining those things together. Except, perhaps, just the process of cause and effect. That's all, but that's something that is very hard to see. One of the reasons it's so hard to see is because people aren't looking in that area. It is the nature of the defilements, of the Kyleses, to stop us looking in that area, to put up all sorts of barriers and obstacles which, when they're removed, can undermine the self's very reason for existence. Those barriers and obstacles need to be overcome. One of the means to overcoming them is panna, or wisdom, some understanding of the Buddha's teaching. Another way is confidence and faith, just believing in those teachings. Even though a person may have been a Buddhist, even a Buddhist monk or nun, for many years, sometimes they don't have that full confidence in the Lord Buddha's teachings. The Buddha said that the five khandhas, starting with rupa, the body, are not me, not mine, not a self. Vidana, sensation, is not me, not mine, not a self. Sana, perception. Saskara, mental formations, and vina a, consciousness, are not me, not mine, not a self. Yet still some people take consciousness, that which knows, to be me. To be mine, to be a self. They take the doer to be me, to be mine, to be a self. They take perception as if they are doing the perceiving, and they take vidana. This feeling of pleasure or pain with each one of the six senses, as personal. I hurt. I'm in pain, I am disturbed, and from that you can see how craving and the whole problem of existence arises. Even this body is taken to be a self, my body. That's one reason we are sometimes so concerned with what food we put inside our bodies. When a person has this delusion of a self in these five areas, it means that they'll be creating a whole heap of craving, clinging and suffering. The Buddha taught that it takes panna, and sada, or faith, in order to overcome this delusion. So how about following the Lord Buddha's instructions? How about looking at these things as non-self? How about focusing on areas of existence that because of the Lord Buddha's teachings you know are the areas you should put your attention on? What do I take myself to be? Sometimes people have so little confidence in the Buddha that they even think they've completely abolished the view that self is identical to the body, or the self is in the body, or the self controls this body of ours. The Lord Buddha said in the Satipahana Sutta, that you should really look at this body and say, is there anything in here that I take to be a self, that I take to be me, that I take to be mine? Don't come to a conclusion too quickly. Take the body as a focus of your contemplation and by contemplation I mean just focusing your awareness on the body and noticing how you relate to it. Notice how you think about this body, notice what you do with it, as if you truly are stepping back from this whole process of mind and body. See the connection between them, see how the delusion of self connects and controls the body. It needs the sustained application of insight practice, just looking or observing the attitudes you have to your body. There comes a time when you start to see the very deep and subtle attachments, the very, very fine threads of delusion, which make this body a problem. You can make this body mine, you can make this body me. These delusions are 
deep and profound and they've been there for a long time. These delusions are hidden. But they can be seen, they can be extricated or disentangled. That is why early on in my practice I very quickly discarded the technique of asking. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Because straight away I saw that who am I? Was implying that I was something or someone. It was the wrong question to ask. Because implicit in that question was the assumption that I was something. I was not quite sure of what I was but it was something. My way of developing insight into Anitta was to ask myself, what do I take myself to be? The question, what do I take myself to be? Was seeing, in the realm of perception, cognition and view dash. What I actually thought I was, what I believed I was. I was uncovering layers and layers of delusion and, as I watched this body, I saw how I thought about this body. How I viewed this body. Sometimes it shocked me to see that after all these years of practice, having read all of these things and having given talks about Anita, I was still taking this body to be me, to be mine, to be a self. I noticed this whenever concern arose about the body, about its health, its longevity, about what it looked like. If someone called me fat or if someone called me skinny or someone made jokes about me, about my race, about my gender, about whatever, if that rattled me in the slightest it was because I still had a view of self towards this body. I still had perceptions, I still had thoughts about this body being something to do with me or mine dash especially if any pain occurred in the body or I started worrying about the safety of this body. I was not willing to let this body go. What you attach to is what you won't let go, what you can't let go, what you want to carry on with, what you protect and what you control. All of this is what comes about from the delusion of a self. People sometimes think they aren't afraid of death, but when things are threatening, when they come face to face with a tiger or a cobra, that is when they find out whether they are afraid of death or not. In my early meditations I used to imagine myself in such situations with snakes or tigers. I would seek out dangers, on the level of imagination, to see if I really did think this body was a self or not. I wanted to see how I actually related to this body and whether I truly perceived or thought of it as self. The Buddha said that one should practice satipahana on the body to know this body as it truly is, know it to the extent that this is just a body, it's not me, it's not mine, and it's not a self. Picking up the gold. It's interesting, especially when we develop deep meditation, to notice how random perception is. Why, of all of the available things to be perceived, do we choose this and not the other? We can see that we are creatures of habit, we perceive according to habit. We perceive this way and not another way because of so much habitual conditioning. Our race, our gender, our upbringing, our experiences all make us choose from the shelf of available options just one or two. So often people choose the same options. It is like going is going to a supermarket shelf where there are so many different sorts of breakfast cereal and yet choosing the same one or two brands. Every time we look at the mind or at the body, we accept the same perception and miss so much more. That's why deep samatha meditation, especially jhanas, blows away those habits. Instead of always taking the same breakfast cereal from the shelf. In that simile, after the experience of jhanas, we try others. We see all the products on the shelf and we know how this whole thing works. Our mind is wide and deep and so powerful that we can do these things. Investigating perception is a wonderful way of developing the wisdom that breaks the illusion of self. It's not only that we think and perceive as an I, but we perceive in such a way that we sustain that delusion. Basically, when we have the delusion of I, we want to keep it. 
There is a simile in the Piasi Sutta, DN 23. Two friends go to a deserted town looking for treasure and they find some hemp and decide to take it away. On the way home one of the men finds some linen, so he throws down the hemp and puts the linen on his head instead. The other man, thinking he had gone to all the trouble of making a well-bound up bundle, decided to continue on with the hemp. Further on they found some copper, then some silver, then some gold. The man who had the hemp on his head said this hemp is good enough for me, but the other friend would always change what he had for that which was worth more. When they got back home the one who brought back the gold was well received by his friends and relations, but the man who only brought back the hemp was driven from the village. We've often had our perceptions for a long time and, because they're well bound up, we carry them on our head as if they were ours. We refuse to let them go to pick up a new perception. We've had these perceptions, especially the way we look at the world, our views and the way we perceive according to those views, for so long that we refuse to put them down and pick up the gold. When we do insight meditation based on deep states of tranquility, we have the ability to put down the old bundles of hemp we've been carrying around for lifetimes and pick up the gold. We need the quietness and stillness of the powerful mind experienced after Janus Dash. The experience after the five hindrances are abandoned, and then the mind can see things in a different way. The mind is so still that it very easily breaks free from the old ways of looking and we get deeper and deeper. Looking deeper means, as it were, taking off those old wrappers, those old perceptions, old views, old ideas. Uncovering the Dhamma, which is wrapped in all our old conditioning, we get to levels that we've never seen before. That's basically what insight is, seeing deeply into the nature of things to the point where it's new, it's something we haven't uncovered before. We go deeper and deeper and deeper, until we find that what we are seeing is exactly what is described in the suttas. It is what the Buddha and the Arans have been teaching us all along but which we had not accepted. Rupa, body, is not me, not mine, not a self. Vedana, feeling, and sana, perception, are not me, not mine, not a self. Saskara, mental formations, are not me, not mine, not a self. Vina A. Consciousness, is not me, not mine, not a self. We go deeper into the saskaras into thoughts and ideas. How many people fight wars over ideas, over arguments on who is right and who's wrong? If we take all these thoughts, all these ideas to be ours, then we'll argue. If we take them to be ours we will think there is a right and wrong there. We should know that they are only thoughts and ideas, some are more accurate than others because they are pointing to reality, but they aren't reality. Sometimes we should look at the thoughts and ideas that arise in our minds with the tool of what do I take to be me, to be mine, to be self. Often we'll be surprised at the thoughts or ideas we are taking to be me, to be mine, to be a self. This is who I am, this is my thought, my idea, and these are my views. You can very easily define yourself by your thoughts and ideas. Sometimes it's good if you think you are a Buddhist, to go and see a born-again Christian who challenges you. Many years ago when I was staying in our old Vara dwelling place, in Perth with a John Jagaro, there was a letter drop in our mailbox from a local born-again Christian group. They were giving a film presentation of the Orange People Exposed, Hinduism Exposed, Buddhism Exposed, and strangely, Enough iridology exposed. I don't know what they had against iridology but that was also included. Everyone was invited and I wanted to go, I asked a John Jagaro. Can I go? I would like a bit of fun, but a John Jagaro wouldn't let me. I was disappointed. It would have been good fun, 
but it would also have been a test to see whether I would be rattled in the midst of so many people who had such completely different views from me. If one is rattled, if one is upset or concerned, one sometimes gets angry or irritated at a view, at an idea. Why? It's because we are taking our own views and ideas to be me, to be mine, to be a self. We should look at these things and ask, what do I take to be me? The delusion of freedom. That which does, the doer, lies very deep inside us. I focus on this choice and freedom because it is a deep part of the delusion of self. It is the reason our Western world, in its delusion, fights for individual freedoms, as if there were any individual freedoms. The freedom to choose, the freedom to be in control of our affairs, is just a delusion. How many people are really free in the West to choose what they want? How many people are completely in the power of advertisements, cultural inducements, peer pressure, conditioning from their youth or from their past lives? How many people are truly free? The answer is only errants. The choices that we make and the decisions that we take are wonderful things to focus on. Watch yourself. Choosing to move your legs, or choosing to scratch yourself on the cheek, or choosing this word rather than that word. What's doing this? Where does this come from? Where does this originate? What chooses? Please never say who chooses, because that implies a being in there somewhere. What chooses? Where does it arise? To be able to see that, you need a very quiet mind, a very peaceful mind. One of the problems people have when they try to do insight meditation and gain deep insight, is not sustaining the attention for long enough. If the mind can't watch the breath for five minutes without wandering away, how can it ever sustain the attention on an object of insight long enough to really uncover it? Five minutes is not enough. We have to watch the meditation object for hours, to see it coming and going. We have to sustain our attention long enough to gain enough data to suspend our old ideas and beliefs, long enough to see the truth. In the simile of the lotus, the sun has to warm the petals of the lotus for long enough for the innermost petals to open up. The mind has to sustain its attention for a long time on something like choice or intention. Satana, one of the most important saskaras, before you can fully understand it, comprehend it and see it for what it is. Satana is conditioned. We know Satana is conditioned because when we get into Jana's Satana stops. Once you start to see Satana as being conditioned, it makes you doubt that it's you who is doing this and you also start to see exactly what Satana is. Remember, I said, that this is the delusion of a self. Satana is real but we mistakenly take it to be a self, we add something to it that isn't there. It's just like a mirage, it's real light. Reaching your retina but we misunderstand it to be something else. It is the same with this Satana, the doer, or rather that which does, choice. Look deeply at it again and again and you start to find out why you say these things, why you do these things repeatedly. We do it because we did it before, we say it because we said it before. Habits, because we got pleasure there before, the mind seeks pleasure there again. We finally see that we can't stop this because it is conditioned. It comes from beyond us, beyond a self, beyond a me. Sometimes people ask the question, and it's a very good question, if Satana is completely conditioned. How on earth can we stop it and get enlightened? We can stop it because the Buddha existed and because we have his teachings that enlightenment of the Buddha produces a condition to stop our satana. Without the enlightenment of the Buddha it would be nearly impossible for us to create the intention ourselves to end Sisera. Because of the conditioned nature of satana, if it doesn't get conditioned by the Buddha, it would just go around and around, it would be self-sustaining. 
it needs some external input to break this cycle, and that comes from the Arats, it comes from the Buddha. It's interesting to watch Satina. I've mentioned to people some of the experiences that I have had with Satana, with my will. Early on I really thought that I was in control of this body and mind. If I decided to do something, I did it. But one of the things that really rocked me in my early years was how much I was a creature of habit, a creature of conditioning. In the hippie era I was a rebel. I thought I was being an individual, making my own choices. That's what rebelliousness is all about. Making your own choices rather than following what everyone else is doing. Then I went to a rock festival and found that everyone else was dressed in the same way as me, they had the same hairstyle with beards, beads, and green velvet trousers. I wasn't the only one. Maybe I was the only one with green velvet trousers in Acton. But not on the Isle of Wight during the festival. I realized that I was just wearing a uniform and from that moment I started to see that it was just a physical, external thing. How much of your mind is just you wearing a uniform? With your choices. With your thoughts, you're the same as everybody else, just like sheep. I remember a monk telling me once that his father was a farmer and he had worked on the farm. One day he found a whole line of sheep completely circling a thicket of bushes in the middle of a field. They couldn't see to the other side of the bushes, so they were all walking around in a circle. He didn't know how long they had been there following the one in front in an unbroken circle, but he suspected that if he hadn't broken the circle they would still be there today, just walking around one following after the other. That's a wonderful simile for our mind just following one thought after another, one choice after another, round and round scissor. Being a farmer he managed to take hold of one of the sheep and pull it out, breaking the line. In that simile, the farmer stands for the Buddha taking out one bit of delusion to stop this whole circular process of conditioning. Look at that which does and ask yourself. Is that what you take yourself to be? Is it important that you have the freedom to choose? Are you afraid of being brain washed and someone else taking over your choice? Are you afraid of surrendering to the Vinaya or the rules of the monastery? Why isn't it that you are taking the choice to be yours? You think you want to be independent, but basically you are under the illusion that Satina is a self a me or mine. Why I tell silly jokes. I once had the opportunity to visit one of the Arats, Tongpilu Sayada. I was with some other monks in Bangkok and we heard that he was in town so we went to see him. He was there and so we went up to chat with him. There was an interpreter present and the other two monks with me asked questions, silly questions I thought, so. I asked the silliest question. I only had the chance to ask one question of this great monk, Tongpilu Sayada. I was cheeky enough to ask him, who was answering these questions? Tongpilu answered straight away, Nama. Even though he only spoke Burmese I understood the Pali word Nama, mind, that's all. It's mind, just a process, it's not Tongpilu answering. That really hit me. When you ask questions of these great monks they sometimes give answers that you don't expect. So these are the things that I contemplate again and again and again. We see that. There's no one answering these questions, it's just Nama, just mind, not a thing, not a person, just a process, that which chooses. Look closely at choice because from choice we get control. Choice is attachment, control is craving and it's what creates. Sisera. You can't be choiceless. That was one of Krishnamurti's many mistakes. Choiceless awareness, he chose to be choiceless. Choice is there, Satana exists, but. We need to see its causes. When we see where it comes from, 
we realize it's not coming from me, it's not coming from a god. It's not coming from anything, it's just cause and conditioning. There are many reasons why I talk like this. If you want to know why I tell silly jokes, it's because my father used to tell silly jokes. It's conditioned, so don't blame me. Once we start to see all of this we understand about Saskara not being a self, not being me, or mine. If it's not ours we can let it go. That's the test to find out if we've truly seen Anita. If we've truly seen that this body is not ours, we can let it go, we can let it die. If someone comes along with a gun and they're about to shoot us, if there's no escape. Okay, let them shoot. We can be without fear because we know this body is not ours. In the same way if someone comes to steal our car and we can't stop them. Okay, off you go. It's not mine. It belongs to the Buddhist society and hopefully the insurance company will buy us a new one if it gets stolen. If they don't it doesn't matter. We just won't go into Naamura on a Friday evening. Great. We should look upon our body in the same way as the monastery car. It's convenient but we don't own it. Whatever it is, if we see that we are losing it and we are afraid or we can't let it go. That means we take it to be ours, there's a self in there somewhere. Can we let go of choice? Can we for example let the senior monk do all the choosing? Why not? Or even deeper, can we stop choosing? When you are meditating, can you let go of Satana when you're practicing Samadhi? What I'm asking is can you enter Jannas? In a jana choosing ceases, we're not doing anything, the mind isn't moving. Satana moves the mind, it wobbles the mind, it disturbs the mind. In jana's the mind is at ease, not moving, you can call it choice-less awareness. Choice-less awareness. In jana's is the moment where there is no choice. There's no new Satana appearing. Just the old Satana from before the jana. People sometimes pull me up on this and Say that in the Anyapada Sutta, MN 111-4, Venerable Sarah put anew in first jhana. That Satana was there. I gave a simile some years ago about where Satana fits into jhana. It's like shooting an arrow, you aim and you let it go. The aim is there, it exists throughout the arrow's flight until it hits the target. But once the arrow is shot from the bow it cannot change its course. The satana is fixed, the aim is fixed, the aim you could say is carried with the arrow until it hits the target. The same applies to jhanas, you have satana, but once the jhana begins, the arrow has left the bow and is flying, carrying that satana, but is unable to be changed until the flight of that mind state ends and the jhana breaks. That's how satana exists within a jhana, it is immovable, unable to be activated. To see that which does as not me or mine, not self, is enough to be able to let it go and be able to abide without thinking, without doing, allowing the process to stop. A John Chaz famous simile is of a leaf that only moves because of the wind blowing. The nature of the leaf is to be still. Take away the wind and the leaf wobbles less and less until it comes to stillness. Take away satana, which is the wind in that simile, and the mind wobbles less and less until it stops in jhana. That's what the jhanas are, the mind stopping and not moving. Those who still haven't seen the satana as not self will have a hard time with jhanas. Contemplate, give rise to insight into non-self. That which does, as not me, not mine, not me doing these things. I'm not choosing these things. Investigate that, until such time as you can see this satana as just a process, it's got its causes, it's got its effects, and you see them all. It's not me. The last citadel. There is another place, which is the last citadel of the self. The self is in a castle. Its own medieval castle. Castles have a citadel or keep, 
the strongest part of the castle. Or fort with all the castle walls around it. Outside the walls are moats and defenses. That's what it's like trying to come to the citadel of the delusion of self. You go through barrier after barrier until you finally come to the heart where the delusion of self hangs out. This is the last place and Mara will defend it almost to the death. That self is the doer and even more so the knower, that which knows, that which experiences, the vina a, the sitta, whichever you like. Do you take that which experiences to be you? Do you think it is me behind the eye when you're seeing, or me listening behind the ears, or me inside the body feeling all these pleasures and pains through the sense of touch or me experiencing the thoughts? You have to investigate this consciousness, the knowing, and ask the question, do I take this to be a self, to be me or mine? The more you know and experience, the bigger the illusion of self becomes. I've been there, I've done that. I know all this, I've experienced all of that. See that? Which knows as not being me, not being mine, not being a self. Test that. Understanding by seeing if you can let go of knowing, let go of experiencing. When? You can put it down, that's when you understand it's not me, not mine, not a self. Can you put down seeing or thinking about seeing, hearing or thinking about? Hearing, smelling or thinking about smelling, tasting or thinking about tasting, touching or thinking about touching in your meditation, or does every sound disturb you? Or, as Ajahn Chah said, do you disturb every sound? If so, why? It's because you still take consciousness, hear the consciousness of the five senses, to be yours. To be you, I am hearing this. If I don't hear this I disappear. That's the reason you won't let go of experiencing this body. If I don't experience this body and everything shuts down, then I don't exist. That's why we can't let go. If we could understand that consciousness, the mind knowing, is not me, not mine, not a self, we could let it go. That way we can get into jhanas easily. This is nothing to do with me. Look at what you take to be a self, the doer or the knower. There will come a time especially after deep meditation when you look at all these. Five khandas, especially the doer and the knower, and you will see to the very depths that there is not a person there, not a being, it doesn't belong to you, it's completely conditioned. A very common simile for the jhanas is the simile of the lake. When there are ripples on the surface there's activity, the mind is not at peace. When we are looking at the lake without any ripples, when the surface is absolutely smooth without any movement or agitation either on the surface or in the water, the mind is at peace. Only then can we look into the water and see to the very depths of the water. If there is any movement it creates distortion in the water, the light gets bent and we can't really see clearly what's at the bottom. Sometimes mud is stirred up at the bottom making it cloudy, but when that water becomes absolutely still and it's been still for a long time, all the mud settles and the water is crystal clear as a result of stillness. We can then look into the water and we can see clearly without delusion, without things being bent and distorted. We can see clearly right to the very bottom of that body of water. Only after jhanas can we see clearly right into the bottom of this mind, right into the bottom of knowing and doing. We can see that. There's nothing there, just a process arising and passing away. If you really see the process that delusion takes to be me or mine or self, not only do you see the truth of an it but you also understand how Sisera works. You see how the process is not a path with a heart, this is a path without any heart. It might not be very amenable to lay people, but the anatta path is a path without any heart whatsoever. If you see that process you can understand how it can generate future births, how the process can go on and on. 
people who understand anatta understand rebirth as well being able to see anatta is to also understand dependent origination cause and effect that process which people misunderstand to be a self to be me to be mine looking at all of these things in terms of what do i take to be self to be me to be mine seeing that these are the things and experience that one takes to be a self helps understand why one can't let them go just knowing that much focusing on that and uncovering the delusion having that still mind so you can see right to the very bottom of the lake you see that there is no one there there's nothing knowing is just a process of consciousness no one is doing it's just satna then like bahaya ad 1.10 you will know that in the seeing there is just seeing there is no one doing the seeing or choosing to do the seeing in hearing smelling tasting touching there is just hearing smelling tasting and touching no one is doing the touching no one is experiencing the touching it's just consciousness and mind objects or mind activity it's not an essential mind not an original mind it's just a process when you see that you'll be free be careful with knowing or doing because it's always as if you're behind a screen and the world is outside it's easy to see that the world beyond is not me not mine not a self but we also need to see the world inside it's like following the beam of a projector not just looking at the screen where the movie is but looking back at where this movie is coming from and seeing it's just a machine making all these illusory images of sight sound smells tastes touches thoughts and mind objects it's just like a movie that's all it's not real we add the reality to it we make the self we construct it through papanka proliferation when we see all of that tracing the thing to its source and seeing that it is completely empty then like bahaya we can live not taking up anything in the world as a self as me or mine there comes the end of rebirth you know stream winning when you've seen how stupid you were for so many lifetimes taking something to be a self usually the doer or the knower you've seen that you've uncovered it you know the stupidity of it you know that it's only a matter of time before perception and thought fall into place you know that sisra is doomed when through each of these senses each of these khandas you don't even perceive or think for a moment that these things are anything to do with a self or with your mind you know it's just a process that's all it becomes like the simile of a meteor circling around the solar system for so many millions of years so many hundreds of millions of years and then suddenly it strikes the atmosphere of the earth and goes out in a blaze of light that's it it's finished gone just as the errants having gone around sizzera for millions tens of millions countless millions of times until they meet the dhamma they meet the dhamma and go out in a brilliant blaze of teaching you know that you cannot claim stream winner falsely if you tell another person that you're a stream winner and it's just boasting and you don't really believe it it's a parajika offense the gravest offense is proscribed by the monastic rules of discipline and you have to leave the monkhood for the rest of your life so please focus on the contemplation of anatta what do i take to be me to be mine to be a self in terms of the five khandas and the six senses not as an intellectual exercise but as a tool to uncover things you've yet to see as a monk tool to uncover things you've yet to see as a monk tool to uncover things you've yet to see as a monk tool to uncover things you've yet to see as a monk tool to uncover things you've yet to see as a monk tool to 